have to produce a child growing up in the Islamic school who will reflect in his dress, reflect in his language, reflect in his behavior, the sunnah of the Prophet They're not following Michael Jackson, they're following Muhammad hmm? And reflect in the values and character. The sunnah of the Prophet Can you do that with the Islamic school in downtown Sydney? I don't think so. It has failed in the United States, it's going to fail all the rest of the world. But if you have the Islamic school in the Muslim village disconnected from the godless world, there you have a much more healthy environment, a much more positive environment to pursue the quest for knowledge and education successfully so that the child will grow up representing in his personality the values of Islam. Let us now come to the market, which is the heart of the Muslim village. When the government comes to the Muslim village, the government should look at the, the market of the Muslim village with wonder, whichever government it is. At the heart of a market in Islam is that it must be a free and a fair market. That's it. There is no economic system of Islam to be worked out from Quran and Sunnah. That's a waste of time. All that Islam insists upon is the establishment of a free and a fair market. And no privileges for anybody. So a Muslim, when he enters into the market, he enters on an equal footing with the kuffar. His enemy is in the market and he's in the market. And the market does not show any favor to the Muslim. Hmm? That's a free and a fair market. The market operates on the principle that it must have business. And business means you can make a profit or you can suffer a loss. So, Riba, the lending of money of interest, is prohibited in this village market. And insurance, which is the sister of Riba, is prohibited in this village. Whether you pass the fatwa that it is haram or that it is makru, we don't want it. We have a collective insurance company in the village. What is our collective insurance company? It's the one we've always had. If your house is burnt down with fire, you have nothing, the whole village will come together. Your misfortune, your misfortune will rally the fraternity of the village. Everybody come together on Sunday morning and all the men roll up their sleeves and we build a simple structure for you that you have a roof over your head. Hmm? And all the women get together and we try to collect clothing for you, your wife, your children utensils for cooking and so on, so that you are given the minimum, the basic necessities for you to survive. That is the insurance. Not that if your house was worth $400,000 and fire burnt it down, the village has to fork up $400,000 to build back another house for you. That's insurance coming, <laughs> not the village. Hmm? So we have our own insurance which is the collective responsibilities of the jama'ah to the individual who is in distress. The principle in the village is that you have to plant if you want to reap. If you're black and you plant, you reap. And if you're white and you don't plant, in this village you're not going to reap. <laughs> huh? This hand is better than this hand. So in the village, no one will beg, no one, unless in a state of dire necessity. Hmm? Everyone prefers to work and live within the means that Allah has provided. Hmm? 
If it is to be a free and a fair market, where you will reap what you plant, we not only have to provide, pro prohibit riba, we have to do something else which is far more difficult. We have to bring back sunnah money. This is going to be the most difficult part of the life of the village. Nobody talks about this. Nobody even knows about this. What is sunnah money? This is our subject for tomorrow night's lecture. Tomorrow night you will hear that sunnah money is also in the Quran. It's in the Quran, it's in the sunnah. Sunnah money is either precious metals or commodities. And sunnah money is money which has intrinsic value. The value of the money is in the money. Tomorrow night you will hear that this money we are using is haram. Because it violates a command in the Quran, repeated three times in the Quran. When we restore sunnah money in the market, now we'll have a free and a fair market. And once we have a free and a fair market, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can intervene and take from some and give to others. And so he distributes and he redistributes wealth. And so you'll notice something in the economy of the Muslim village that you will not find anywhere else in the world. What is it? That the rich do not remain permanently rich. And the poor do not remain permanently poor. That is the characteristic of the economy around the world today. The whole earth. But not the Muslim village. Wealth now circulates through the economy. Hmm? Because we have restored a free and a fair market. Of course, when we implement the laws of Allah pertaining to inheritance and so on, this also assists in the process of redistribution of wealth. We have zakat in the Muslim community. And so through this process of charity, we're able to help those who are in need. The Muslim village will have its cemetery where our dead are buried. And of course, the way every Muslim wants to be buried soon, not too late. Mm -hmm. They keep the bodies for four days, five days. And then they have a very elaborate funeral service. And they have eulogies, people getting up and making speeches and so on. And then you have a cortege, a funeral procession and so on, for, for big men, for big men. So when this, this funeral takes place, the whole world can see it was a somebody here. <laughs> this was a somebody. But when, when he is a nobody, there's no need to keep the body for five days. No need for any elaborate funeral service and no need for any eulogies and so on. And when he's going down to be buried, the casket, not for $5,000, a little thing for $100. So as the funeral is going down and being buried, you know, this was a nobody. Not in our Muslim village. It doesn't matter who you are, we all are buried the same way. The equality of Islam. Mm -hmm. No delay, no delay in burial. But Notice something. I don't know whether you notice it. The godless cities of the world take the cemetery and put it far away. So the only time you ever go to the cemetery is when you're burying somebody. And after you bury him, then you have to go to this one's grave and that one's grave and that one's grave, make dua for them which is the sunnah of the Prophet because it's the only time you go to the cemetery. But it's the sunnah of the Prophet to go to the cemetery at other times. Even in the night time he'll be going to the cemetery. Nobody is there. This is his sunnah. To remember those who have died. Don't forget them. Remember them in your hearts. 
and go to the cemetery and pray for Allah's mercy on them. So in our village, the cemetery will not be out in the outskirts. The cemetery will be in the heart of the city. You have one part of the Muslim village which is allocated for housing. In the center of that section for housing is a masjid. And next to the masjid, or as close as possible to the masjid, is a cemetery. So when you go into the masjid, you pass the cemetery, you're coming back, you pass the cemetery. So every day you'll be seeing the dead. So you'll never forget death. The godless world doesn't want you to remember death. The houses that we build in the Muslim village must all reflect the simplicity and austerity of Islam. Because the Quran has prohibited extravagance and waste. Israf. How big should our house be? You know the hadith when the Prophet ﷺ was stand up for Salat, Tahajjud, with his wife Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and was sleeping there beside him. When he would stand up, she would stretch out her legs. And she'll get a chance to stretch out her legs for a long time because he'd be standing for a long time. When he goes down for sijda, then she will pull in her legs. Radiallahu ta'ala anha. It indicates how small was the space. Surely you have in the Messenger of Allah the best example. Best example how to build a house. <laughs> What's the size of your house? And so the houses in the Muslim village are going to be small and simple. Not requiring $400,000. You probably could be able to build a house in how much? 10,000? They're, they're building their houses. They already bought the land. Already bought the land and they're building their houses in about 10,000 to 15,000 dollars. Mm. We can introduce modern technology into our construction in order to make the structure of the house stronger. Mm. But we should not introduce unnecessary modern technology that we don't need. Yes, it's there. But we have no need for it. Like, someone gives me a gift. You ever saw the palm computer? Huh? It's small, you can fit on your palm. It's a computer. You can log on to the internet with it. One uh, uh, person gives you a gift of this palm computer. It's worth about a thousand dollars, US. But you fiddling with it and you say, fantastic machine, but I don't have any need for it. Huh? Should I keep it just because it's a nice toy? Should I keep it just because the neighbors are going to be impressed he has a palm computer? Huh? Should I keep it just for the excitement and the fun of it? Because it's modern technology? No! A Muslim must act responsibly in his utilization of the resources that Allah has placed at his disposal. That money which went towards this palm computer, which I don't need, somebody else might need it. This money can go to help the jihad to liberate the Holy Land. And so in the Muslim village, we spend our money wisely with austerity, simple houses. In order to build village life, and village life of course is where everybody knows everybody else, and everybody interacting with everybody else every day. They know like downtown Sydney, you don't know who's your neighbor next door. In the village, in that part of the village which is allocated for housing, we don't want any motor cars. No motor cars. 